It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ron Tyler. We have wanted Dr. Tyler here for years because he's, to me, the preeminent historian on the imagery of Texas, which we all use in our publications, websites, uh, school guides, uh, and he's an expert on all of it, but tonight he will be talking about maps because we're mappy people here. Dr. Ron Tyler is the direct, is retired director at Amon Carter Museum of American Art in Fort Worth. I know previously he was a historian there as well. Uh, he previously served as director of the Texas State Historical Association, professor of history at the University of Texas at Austin, and was editor of the Southwestern Historical Quarterly and the New Handbook of Texas. Dr. Tyler has authored and edited more than 20 books in the history and art of Texas, the American West, uh, and Mexico. His latest book, Lithograph, Texas Lithographs, A Century of History and Images, will be published next year by University of Texas Press, and his talk tonight is entitled Lithography and 19th Century Texas Mapping. Please help me welcome Dr. Tyler. Thank you, Mark. Uh, he's given me fair warning. I'm standing between you and the bar, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll handle this as expeditiously as I can. And it reminds me of one of the favorite sayings of one of my professors. Uh, he always said, this mind can only absorb what the seat can endure. Well, I want to talk to you about Texas lithographs, and it's possible that you don't know what a lithograph is, and if that's the case, you're not the only person in the room, I'm sure. It's a picture, but it's more than just a picture. Now, I'll start out by pointing out that the 19th century was the age of the illustrated press, not only in this country, but in the rest of the world as well. And I'll illustrate that by this young man, Charlie Seringo. You may know Charlie Seringo. He wrote the only, or the first cowboy autobiography. In 1882, the winter of 1882 and 83, he was a young cowboy in Indian territory in the middle of winter and bored to tears along with eight other young Texas cowboys. And they decided that they needed something, some choice literature to read to make up, uh, to kill the time, to entertain themselves during this winter. So they agreed that for every curse word and for every grayback that they picked off and threw on the floor without killing, they would have to pay a fine. And he said within 24 hours, they had enough money that they could subscribe to some literature. And so they voted on what they would subscribe to. And the winner was the Police Gazette. And he Ask, he said, there were two illiterate young Texas cowboys in the group. And he said, why in the world do you want that wicked magazine? And they said, because we can read the pictures. <laughs> that, that's why lithographs are important. They produced pictures that people could read. And it was the first time that really was true of if you will, the common people. Here's a quote from 1826. The cheapness and facility of the lithographic process, the number and goodness of the impressions to be obtained from a single plate, the spirit of these impressions, they being facsimiles of the original drawing, show that it is a most important, most valuable substitute for copper plate engraving in all but the highest branches of the art. Fast, cheap, and a facsimile of the original. In fact, the inventor of lithography, Eloise Sinefelder, a German, called each copy of a lithograph an original. And here's why. There were only three methods of printing in 1800. Uh, two of them are very well known. A relief engraving means that you put ink on a raised surface, such as an alphabet here, 
and you press the paper on that raised surface and you get a reproduction of that surface. The other method was the intaglio method of etching. You put ink in a grooved surface, you press the paper onto that surface very hard so that it goes into the groove and contacts the ink and you get a printed surface. Lithography, by comparison, is a planographic process. It is chemical printing. It's printed off of a smooth stone and it's done chemically. So you get an exact impression of the original in the print and it, it is uh, planographic. So you don't have to cut, etch, engrave, anything. It's chemical, and that makes it a little easier. And also, it uh, means that the, you get more prints, usually, because you're not having to press the uh, object so hard that you're damaging your uh, uh, letter surface. Now, you can tell a lithograph because what you see in the, in the image is actually the grain of the stone. And you can also tell that most of them are hand printed in the 19th century because here you can see the artist has actually painted outside the line in these two instances. So most of the color on lithographs for the 19th century are hand painted. Later in the century they were printing by color. It's called a chromolithograph and that both are common in lithographs that are related to Texas. Now, here's a young man. He's standing on the shore. You can see the ships to the right there. He's got his hand over his heart. Some people say he's making a Masonic sign. His colleagues are working back here. They're cutting down trees because they're building a house. They're building a fort. This is an imaginary drawing by Horace Vernet in Paris of the colony of Jean d'Azile on the Trinity River in Liberty, near Liberty, Texas. And this is supposed to represent the Trinity River with the ships out there. So theoretically, they could return anytime they wanted to. Jean d'Azile was a short-lived experience in Texas. After the Napoleonic defeat, the Napoleonic soldiers could not work anywhere in France except on their family farm. In other words, they had no place to go and they had nothing to do. That led to a lot of discontented soldiers. Many of them came to the United States. One group of them started a colony, a successful colony in Alabama. Another group of them came to the Trinity River in 1818 in Spanish Texas to try to start a colony. It wasn't successful, but they did start it. They were there for about six months and the uh, Spanish heard about it. They sent an army. Uh, Jean Lafitte, who had helped the uh, Chant d'Azil colony get started, warned them that the Spaniards were coming after them, so they all packed up and left. They went back to New Orleans and then scattered. By the time the Spaniards arrived at the site of Chant d'Azil, uh, they said it's a good thing they left because this fort that they built is built according to all the specifications and it would have been uh, rough for us to have to fight them. Well, uh, that's the end of Chant d'Azil colony. But in Paris, it became a cause celebre because the anti-monarchists in Paris said, look what they've done to our brave soldiers who defended the fatherland for all these years. They've, they've, they've made them go into a foreign country. Uh, you know, they're having a hard time surviving. So the anti-monarchists used Jean d'Azile as propaganda against the monarchy. So there were banquets to raise money for the troops in Saint the settlers, I'll say, in Jean d'Azile. Uh, there were uh, a number of lithographs like this produced, supposedly depicting Jean d'Azile on the Trinity River, uh, obviously pl illustrated plates, uh, books, maps. Jean d'Azile becomes a cause célèbre, and for two years in Paris, lithographs and books and plates and music, sheet music, are produced about Jean d'Azile and then it's over, it's gone. And by the time Stephen F. Austin arrived a couple of years later, he said, when I explored this country in 1821, it was a wild, howling, interminable solitude from Sabine to Behar. So Jean Dezeel, although it produced the first lithographs that relate to Texas, had very little impact on the geography or really the history of uh, Texas. Now, at the end of the 19th century, 
A salesman representing the American stationer said Texas is the only southern state which is fully imbued with the spirit of northern enterprise. Texas had almost 10,000 miles of railroad track in 1900, over 14,000 miles in 1910. The railroad grew dramatically after the Civil War. And when he was in Galveston in 1880, former President U.S. Grant said Texas is an empire in itself. So the lithographs done during the 19th century helped tell the story of Texas from that wild and howling wilderness to the empire illustrated, which you see here on uh, uh, Leslie's uh, uh, newspaper. It tells the story of 19th century, a story of 19th century, not necessarily the story of 19th century Texas. This is probably the first separately illustrated map of Texas. It was printed in Mexico in 1826 by an Italian immigrant named Claudio Linati. Linati had fled Italy because he was involved in uh, anti-government or revolutionary activities that would led, have led to his jailing or, or, or perhaps even to his execution if he had stayed around. And it was printed on a, he brought the printing press to Mexico and he actually taught lithography in the Academy of San Carlos in Mexico City. But he very quickly started an illustrated magazine in Mexico that got him into political trouble there too, so he had to leave there very shortly. But before he left, he printed this map. And this is probably the uh, very map that uh, Manuel de Mier y Terran carried with him on his uh, exploration and, and inspection of Texas in 1828. And supposedly, handwriting experts suggest that these actually are Terran's notes as he carried this map with him on his expedition in Texas. So it's, it's, it's one of the first lithographs that really, I guess it is the first uh, lithograph that is related to an eyewitness uh, uh, drawing of Texas. It's based on one of the maps that Stephen F. Austin sent to Mexico to document his uh, colony in the uh, uh, Briscoe here at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, it was collected by the, the great uh, bibliographer Henry Wagner and he actually gave it to the University of Texas because he thought that's where it really belonged. Well, following that 1828 uh, expedition, of course, came the law of April 6, 1830, and then the Texas Revolution. There aren't any artists in Texas at that time that we know of, no, no eyewitness pictures of Texas at that time have survived that are lithographs, but we have this wonderful remainder here. It's a lithographic map of, uh, of uh, the Presidio at Goliad. And it was lithographed by Alfred Baker in New York after the drawing by this young man, Joseph Chadwick. Chadwick was a, a graduate of West Point. Uh, as he, he dropped out, went to St. Louis, worked in his uncle's store for a while, was bored. So he uh, came to Texas and joined the Texas Revolution. He joined Fannin's uh, group at uh, Goliad. He was, had some training at West Point, so Fannin recognized that talent and had him named his aide. And one of the things he asked him to do was to draw a map of the fort, which he did and sent to his parents in his last letter. So after uh, Chapman, Chadwick was killed along with many of the other Goliad uh, uh, troops, this lithograph was printed in 1836 uh, in New York. So it's, it's an eyewitness drawing basically of the uh, fort at, uh, at uh, Goliad. And if you want more information on this, take a look at uh, Jim's book on Herman, Herman Ehrenberg. Other illustrations that relate to the revolution, having nothing to do with an eyewitness, there are cartoons and caricatures. Uh, this is one, General Houston accepting the surrender of Santa Ana and Coos. He's accusing them of, uh, of, uh, of the Alamo and Goliad, and, and both of them are saying, me no Alamo. This was a, a caricature, a cartoon printed in New York in uh, 1836, shortly, probably shortly after the battle. Uh, and there are imaginary pictures of the Battle of the Alamo that were printed later too. This one was printed in 1845 in a little book called A Forget-Me-Not, and it's a hand-colored uh, uh, lithograph. Well, after the revolution, the lithographs uh, get more popular related to Texas, not in Texas, but related to Texas. This is uh, August Allen and John Kirby Allen. The Allen brothers uh, bought a piece of land on Buffalo Bayou 
and announced the city of Houston, and they produced this map. Edward Stiff, who was in Houston at that time and later wrote a book about his experience, said a splendid map of the city was carried on the wings of the wind to distant places to catch the, in time the greedy speculator and allure the uninitiated. So that's, and it's a very rare map. The, the only uh, complete copy I know of is in the Bryan Museum in uh, Galveston. The Houston Public Library has the proof from which this was made, uh, but it's in pretty bad shape. But that did inspire a number of other maps. Of course, uh, next year there's this map of Galveston that was produced, and the year after that, a map of Colorado City on the Colorado River. And Colorado City was at one time considered to be the capital of Texas, but it didn't make, it never developed. And so what we have of Colorado City is a map of a city that never existed. 1837, one of the most famous people in America visits the Republic of Texas, John James Audubon. Audubon is in the midst of trying to finish his great book on the birds, the birds of America. He's in the closing days and he's trying to find as many birds as he can and he always had wanted to come to Texas. He tried several times to make an expedition to Texas, wasn't able to do it. As soon as the war was over, he heads to Texas and he gets there and he says, you know, this is one of the great flyways of the continent. They're, they're all, all the birds of America are here. And, and, and I, basically I've already painted them all. So he said, what I gain by coming to Texas is the confidence to go ahead and publish my book because I know that I've found all the birds. Well, he hadn't found them all, but he had found most of them. Um, he was also collecting for his second book, uh, the, uh, uh, a, a book on the quadrupeds of North America. And he had his son with him on that trip, John Woodhouse Audubon, and uh, John Woodhouse Audubon did about half the drawings for the quadrupeds. Now there's one bird that uh, may uh, owe its existence as an Audubon print to that trip to Texas, and it's Havel's turn. Audubon had collected Havel's turn much earlier and had painted it, but he had lost the specimen. So he wasn't sure in 1837 that the bird was exactly right because he had not seen another bird since that one that he collected and painted. He'd lost, lost the specimen. In Texas, he saw Havel's turn. So he was able to collect another example. He took it back to London with him where he was printing his book. He made very minor adjustments to the painting and published the book. So as far as I know, this is the only bird in Audubon's Birds of America that directly relates to Audubon's trip. The mockingbird, the uh, swans, the herons, the, all the other birds he had already seen. He'd seen them in Louisiana. He also uh, then goes ahead and does his great book on the quadrupeds. This is quadruped number one. Uh, it's from a Texas specimen, the common American uh, wildcat. But the, the, the rabbit and the armadillo are, to, are two of the most in-demand uh, prints, of course, by the collectors. Well, in that same year, or, or the next year, we almost got a lithographic shop in Texas because John W.J. Niles, the son of uh, Hezekiah Niles, the editor of uh, Niles Weekly Register, one of the most widely read newspapers in the United States at that time, came to Texas and got, him, got into the newspaper business. He started the National Banner in Houston, and he had this ad published. Uh, he's starting a letterpress and lithographic printing establishment in Houston. Uh, he uh, is a supporter of Lamar for the president of Texas, and they're going to work together, and he's going to get government contracts from the Republic of Texas, and he's going to be a successful printer like his father. Didn't work out. Uh, the, uh, as far as I know, nothing was ever printed from this press. He sold it to a group that moved to Austin and started a newspaper in Austin when Lamar moved the capital to Austin, and then they sold the press, and it disappears. We don't really know what happened to the press, and we've not found anything that claims to be published from that press. This is a map of Austin that was done in 1839, published in New Orleans, could have been published on that press if that press had been operative, but it wasn't. They were depending upon New Orleans for their lithographs at this time, 
and these people sell themselves as the lithographer for the Republic of Texas. Uh, this view of Austin in 1840 is a hand-colored uh, lithograph, published as the frontispiece to Texas in 1840. Could have been published on that press if it had been operative uh, in Texas. Now, in the 1840s, there are a number of immigrants who come to Texas, and so we see a number of views of Texas cities. We see Galveston here by uh, a man named Charles Hooten. Hooten was a Britisher, a writer, but also a trained artist. And he came to Texas with a number of other Britishers, and he, he said he knew he'd made a mistake before they ever landed. Because as they started approaching Galveston, they saw all these white buildings that you know, looked like uh, something you'd see on the Mediterranean Sea, you know, one of those wonderful cities. And it, but he said, as we approached, we began to see that they were wooden, that they were all run down. And by the time we got there, we knew we'd made a really bad mistake. He was in Galveston only about six months. When he got back to England, he wrote a series of articles and then compiled them into a book, which unfortunately was published posthumously because he uh, died of uh, malaria that he had contracted while he was in Galveston. Uh, but his book was published along with the lithographs that he included. This is his view of Galveston from the bay side looking, uh, pardon me, from the gulf side looking back toward the bay. Uh, also a Britisher who arrived a few years later was Matilda Charlotte Ferris Houston. She and her husband arrived in Texas in 1844 in their own yacht, a military yacht with uh, uh, formidable d guns and their own physician and their own crew. This is, a, this is supposedly a picture of Galveston and it, it looks like it could be right. Here's a picture of Houston though. <laughs> <coughs> And I, my, my theory is, you know, that Mrs. Houston told the lithographer that she wanted pictures of Galveston and Houston, and he consulted his inventory to see what pictures he had that he could copy and call Houston. Uh, at least that's what it looks like to me. But look what happens to this picture. It's picked up by a newspaper. It's picked up in Mexico. It's picked up in Germany. And finally, in France, these two pictures become the face of the Republic of Texas as far as the rest of the world is concerned, because that's what everybody saw. Those were the pictures of Texas that were most widely uh, published during the 1840s and the uh, 1850s. 1840s, of course, German immigration. Uh, there are a number of uh, lithographs that relate to German immigration. This was the cover to uh, a, a contract uh, this is a view of uh, New Braunfels done by Conrad Kasper Rordoff. Uh, uh, and and it's, it's a wonderful view of New Braunfels done about 1849, published in about 1850. And Jim Kearney has a wonderful article in the Southwestern Historical Quarterly on it if you're uh, curious about it. Uh, unfortunately, Rordoff was killed in a fight uh, and, and did not live to produce the big illustrated book on Texas that he was working on at the time of his death. Uh, Henry Castro, of course, settled Castroville and wrote a book uh, on uh, La Texas to encourage immigrants. It includes this view, this lithograph of Castroville by Herman J uh, Theodore Gentile, as well as this beautiful map. And I, I love the map because you can see the Medina River here and how it curves and all the plots are right on the river. And then you can look at the view and you can see the curve in the river with all the houses right right where those plots are. So the map and the, and the view closely relate to each other. Of course, uh, this was a time of tremendous growth of slavery in uh, Texas. In uh, 1846, there were approximately 30,000 slaves in Texas. By 1860, that number had increased to over 182,000. So slavery becomes very important in Texas, really almost from the get-go. Austin wrote to Mary Austin Holly and said, it has to be a slave territory. There is no other choice. So slavery becomes an issue. Texas becomes an issue in the presidential campaign in 1842. Texas is personified here as a, a fierce looking slave woman. Uh, here's Andrew, uh, this is uh, Martin Van Buren. He's the presidential candidate in 1844 being prodded by Jackson who was backing him. And he says, I just can't face her. 
And here's Polk over here talking to Dallas, his vice presidential candidate. And he says, well, what about it? You know, she's not all that bad. And that presidential salary of $25,000 a year, what do you say? Well, of course, they were elected. Here is a, a portrait of Charlotte Cordray, who, who had murdered Jean-Paul Surratt during the French Revolution, believing that his death would end the violence of the French Revolution. There were, there were people who believed that if they were able to keep Texas out of the Union, that would end the violence. They didn't keep Texas out of the Union, and that didn't intend, uh, end the violence. But here are their names, and this, this, this poster was published to uh, honor them. War with Mexico comes on, of course. One of the best artists involved in the War with Mexico was uh, Captain D.P. Whiting. Uh, he was with uh, Taylor's Army when they landed at Corpus Christi, and he did this picture of the uh, encampment at uh, Corpus Christi. He intended to do several prints. He did, he had a, he did a portfolio of five, and he, had, he called it Army Portfolio Number One, obviously intending to do Army Portfolio Number Two and Number Three if that was successful. But what happened is the war caught the attention of lithographers everywhere, and he said the numerous exaggerated and spurious illustrations of a cheap character had satiated the public curiosity. So his print did not sell well. It was very well reviewed by everybody who looked at it, but it didn't sell well, and so there was only one Army Portfolio Number one, he didn't publish another one. The best material relating to the war with Mexico, though, was published in 1851 after the war was over by uh, George Wilkins Kendall, the editor of the New Orleans Picayune, and uh, uh, Carl Nebel, an artist that he had met in Mexico. Nebel was a German artist who was in Mexico. He had already done a beautiful portfolio on Mexico landscapes and volcanoes and costumes and so forth. So he and, he and uh, Kendall signed a contract together to jointly produce this book. This is the, the only Texas plate in the book. It's the, the Battle of Palo Alto. How many of you have been to the battleground at Palo Alto? How many of you saw mountains when you were there? <laughs> well, I, I don't think Neville, uh, he says in the introduction to the book that he visited all the places, but I, if he visited the Battle of Palo Alto, he is really taking a, a license here to put mountains in the background. What I think might have happened is he might have been looking at this picture uh, in Thomas Bangs Thorpe's book, which appeared before his book did. Uh, this is the battlefield, and there, Thorpe has put a tree line back there, uh, uh, but he's not enough of an artist that I think Neville might have mistaken that for a line of mountains. Not sure, but that is a possibility at any rate. Well, lithography in Texas, uh, this is the first lithograph that I know that was printed in Texas. It's a caricature of Sam Houston and it was done by uh, Wilhelm Tillipoppi. Uh, Tillipoppi was a German immigrant, uh, an architect, uh, an artist, or a bit of an artist. He later became the reconstruction mayor of San Antonio called the singing mayor of San Antonio. And uh, here's an ad that appeared in the San Antonio Zeitung for their lithographic office. Uh, he uh, did this beautiful uh, picture of San Antonio on letterhead. He did this uh, map of uh, San Antonio. I think this is the only known copy. Uh, but they failed, not enough business. And also they were working with a used press from uh, New Orleans. It just was, uh, the editor of the San Antonio Zeitung said, Mr. Tillipoppi reinvented lithography, but the press was inferior, so the, the business project failed. Well, there are a whole series of what one uh, German uh, settler called pretty pictures or candy for the uh, immigrants. This is, uh, uh, Rosenberg's picture of uh, the Capitol. This is Rordoff's picture of New Braunfels. Hermann Lunkwitz was another of the German immigrants. This is his picture of Fredericksburg. He also did this picture of San Antonio. These, these were all published elsewhere in Europe. Most of them were sent to Europe because they expected the main audience to be in Europe. They even sent along lists of people in Europe so they could be forwarded directly from the printer and wouldn't have to come back to this country. Wonderful lithographs. These are all based on eyewitness uh, drawings. Uh, this is a picture of Indianola. H Helmet Holes was a sailor on one of the ships in the harbor. Notice, if you will, the flags. All the flags in this uh, picture are uh, American flags, but uh, at the uh, San Jacinto Museum, 
There's another picture, and all the flags are Texas flags. And at the Eamon Carter Museum, there's a copy of this print, and the flags are vacant. They're empty. Uh, so the lithographer has left it up to the buyer. What flag would you like us to add to your copy of this uh, print? Uh, this is a pre-Civil War picture of Galveston. I unfortunately have been able to find out very little about this print, but it's a beautiful print. But we know that it was done uh, after the St. Mary's Church was built because there it is, and you can tell that the artist actually knew what St. Mary's Church uh, looked like. 1845, Henry Tanner's, ma Tanner's map of Texas in 1845. Uh, here's the line, here's Austin right here. He raises a big question about the settlement of Texas because just west of Austin, that's range of the Comanches. So he's raised that uh, concern. The German uh, Adelsverein, the company that brought the German immigrants into Texas, uh, hired a young uh, archaeologist to look at the territory that they had bought because they thought there might be some minerals there that would be worthy. So Ferdinand von Romer uh, did his research, published his book in Germany, uh, with complete with all these Texas specimens and with a beautiful map, but uh, it was a scientific uh, contribution, not a monetary contribution in terms of minerals discovered or anything like that. Then the U.S. Army comes into uh, uh, Texas after the war with Mexico. Well, actually, this guy came before the war was over. He came in uh, 1845. Uh, he started at Bent's Fort in Colorado, came down the Canadian River, and uh, then across Oklahoma Territory, or Indian Territory. And in the panhandle, he spotted this, what he called a pillar rock, and he said it may be a beacon for future travelers. So he did this picture of it, and then on the map that he included, he shows us the Pillar Rock. I've never found the Pillar Rock, but he shows it to be on the south side of the river, and I'm still looking for it. I found something that approximates the Pillar Rock on the north side of the river, on the Bivens Ranch, but uh, this one he shows clearly to be on the uh, south side. A Couple of years later, uh, Randolph Marcy is looking for the source of the Red River. He thinks he's found it, and he illustrates it here. And he illustrates it with all of the force of American romantic painting and the sublime. And, uh, and his, his language at this point just becomes, uh, well, su superfluous to say the least. Included a map too. Unfortunately, he really didn't discover the source of the Red River. He found the source of one branch of the Red River. A couple of years later, the Whipple Survey, a part of the Pacific Railroad Survey, goes along the same territory. Uh, Mulhausen is the artist on that survey. He does a number of uh, pictures of landscape and Indians, and then the boundary survey at, this, at, at uh, the same time. Uh, the survey between, from San Diego to Brownsville to establish the new boundary between the United States and Mexico. And this is very interesting. Not only is it some of the best art of this period, but uh, Mr. Schott is a very interesting artist, and he does several of the best pictures in the book. Here's a portrait of uh, an Apache man, or pardon me, a Lipan man. Schott believed that plants were sentient and had lives like us, except that they were rooted in the ground and couldn't move. So he really is very interested in plants. And he believed that the Native Americans had a special relationship with plants. Look how all the plants are leaning and pointing toward this man. He's trying to show you that special relationship. And then in this picture, I've never found out where the uh, prairie of the antelope is, but in this picture, he's got a curtain of plants. Now, what he's supposed to be illustrating is the boundary and possibly a territory for a railroad, but what he's done is he's put this curtain of plants in front of what he's really supposed to be illustrating because plants is what he was really interested in. He served his own purpose as well as the purpose of the uh, expedition. And then, of course, Andrew B. Gray, had he was specifically looking for a railroad. And the map shows that, and then he illustrates Cathedral Peak or Guadalupe Peak along the way. And the Civil War starts, of course, in 1861, and Sam Houston says that I survived the ruin of this glorious union. Not a lot on the Civil War in Texas, of course, because even though we were avoiding some of the worst uh, of, the, of the blockade, uh, we were still having a stressful time in Texas. 
uh, this artist did a picture of the entire coastline of the United States at that time. This is one part of it. This is the Texas coastline. Uh, this sort of illustrates the status of the war in a caricature, and look how they caricature Texas. A man shooting slaves, $1,000 a head, expensive shooting, he says. Uh, Camp Tyler was a Confederate prisoner of war camp in Tyler. One of the prisoners did this uh, lithograph of the war, of the camp after the war was over. He did a drawing of the camp, folded it up, and put it under his uh, epaulets on his uh, jacket and smuggled it out of the camp in order to be able to do this picture. Battle of Dove Creek. You may not know about Dove Creek. There were some Kickapoos who were going through Texas in 1865. George B. Erath said their entrance into Texas aroused the frontier at once. So a group of Confederates went out to stop them. The Kickapoos were only trying to get to Mexico. They were just passing through. But the Confederates uh, uh, went after them. The Indians knew they were coming. They set up an ambush, basically, and, and, and routed the Confederates and then continued their trip to Mexico. And this Mexican printer, Victor Debray, did this game, and it is a game, several years later, to commemorate that uh, uh, Indian victory at uh, Dove Creek. And here are the instructions for playing the game. Basically, it's a game of checkers. Whoever gets all their men on the baseline of the other one wins the game. Reconstruction Texas is a mess. You've already heard people talk about how difficult Reconstruction Texas was. And here is a caricature to illustrate that. It's called Young Texas. And on his sword, it says, for Reconstruction. He has a huge gun, an uh, oversized bottle of old rot gut. And look at the spur. This is, this is a caricature of Texas after the Civil War. Gregory was the man who was sent to Texas to run the Freedmen's Bureau. And Oliver Howard, the head of the Bureau, said, Gregory was so fearless of opposition or danger that I sent him to Texas, which seemed in 1865 to be the post of greatest peril, the worst place in the South. St. Louis Globe in 1879. In Texas, the life of a man is held in but little higher esteem than that of an ox or a horse. And in 1890, in the Dallas Morning News, Mr. Butte of Commerce says, the idea that life and property in Texas are not safe prevails not only in Washington, but also in the Pacific Coast, and it is deep-rooted. Post-Civil War, Texas is trying to recover. It has a head start on the other southern states because it wasn't invaded, but it's still in bad condition. And it has the cowboy already as its representative. And the cowboys are well represented in lithography. Not all quite as heinous looking as young Texas. Uh, this map, a wonderful map of all the cattle trails. Texas Jack is one of the first cowboys that, with a Texas name, who goes into entertainment. And the image of the cowboy then gradually begins to change. Now here is uh, A.H. Below, who owned the Galveston News and who also founded the Dallas Morning News. He founded the Dallas Morning News as an extension of the Gal da Galveston News after they had a telegraph line from Galveston to Dallas. The Dallas paper just basically reproduced the Galveston paper for a while before they got on their feet. But Below is represented here as the gentleman rancher. A very different look of the Texas cowboy, if you will. And here's Syringo's autobiography, uh, the first cowboy autobiography. He's actually written a book that J. Frank Doby called one of the most original and best books about the cowboy. But look what the Galveston News had to say about it. Slang expressions. I can't quite read that, but. Forms of expression. Yeah. He's criticizing his language. So, you know, and, and Seringo grew up in Matagorda near Galveston. If he was looking for a hometown review, he, he got one, <laughs> but not what he was looking for. Uh, they might have been looking for something like Mr. Potter of Texas, which was a novel based loosely on the my, uh, life of uh, Shanghai Pierce, so very well known uh, rancher in Texas. And of course, the ranchers were then having their own banquets by this time, being a very civilized and, and uh, courteous group of people. Amidst all this, lithography begins in Texas, and it began in Galveston with a man named Miles Strickland. 
He started his store in 1858. He added lithography in uh, 1868. But according to the Galveston News, the enterprise was not properly appreciated. It didn't really catch on because Texans weren't ready for beautiful printing. There was not much of a market. But Strickland went ahead. He did this beautiful map of Galveston in 1876. And at the same time, the city view phase was taking over in the country. 1871, this bird's eye view of Galveston was printed. Uh, 1885, Augustus Cook, another bird's eye view artist, did this wonderful view of Galveston. And this view sort of gave the Texas lithographers an opportunity to get involved in the game, if you, if you, again, if you will, because there was a big fire in Galveston in late 1885. And Strickland and company copied Koch's Koch's view there to produce a view that shows you where the fire was. And then in 1886, the Opera Glass, which was an entertainment, a weekly entertainment newspaper in Galveston, copied Koch's view again to produce a bird's eye view of Galveston. They said they sold 25,000 of them, I don't know. And then, uh, Clark and Quartz, another big lithographer in Galveston, just did a map to show the fire. And finally, uh, Thomas Goggins, uh, 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 a music publisher in Galveston, did this uh, sheet music on the Galveston Fire of 85. So the lithographers and, and, and businessmen in Galveston got a little lift out of that uh, bird's eye view. Same time a bird's eye view was done in Dallas. And here's the real reason for these views. Joseph McCoy, was a young lawyer who had just arrived in Dallas and sort of looked around and began to try to figure out prospects for setting up in Galveston, in Dallas. And he writes to his fiance, now about my staying in Texas, you must begin to think about it. If Texas is going to be what I'll say it is, I expect I can do better here than any place else. And he sent two copies of this view, one to his family and one to his fiance. And of course, they did move to Dallas, and McCoy became uh, one of the, if you will, sort of founders of the uh, city. So the bird's eye view was a part of pr serious promotion. So was this uh, little booklet. Uh, an anonymous artist at the Galveston Cotton Exchange did a whole series of, of cartoons, of sketches from the Cotton Exchange, and Strickland published them as a booklet, which they then mailed far and wide uh, to cotton exchanges all over the world. Also, the Galveston Mardi Gras celebration started in 1867 and really took off, and Strickland and other lithographers did a nice business printing uh, invitations for the Mardi Gras. They also, this is a, a bond for the cotton exchange. This is the lithographic stone that's in the Rosenberg Library, and this is a proof plate for that lithographic stone. And if you look very carefully, there's a wonderful drawing of the Galveston Wharf done by the artist Mosier, who had done one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, invitations that I just showed you. This is Mr. Quartz of Clark and Quartz. Clark and Quartz became by far the biggest and most important lithographer in uh, Galveston. Uh, they also expanded uh, into Mexico and Central America and, and did a number of maps, county maps, city maps, they even, they even trademarked the Texas flag. This is the document from the Library of Congress where they're trademarking the uh, Texas flag. In Houston, the lithographer there was W.H. Coyle. In Dallas, it was the Dallas Lithographic Company. They did beautiful work like this, including this map of Alvarado and this bird's eye view of the seaport of Dallas. Because remember, they're trying to get ships up the Trinity River. Even Jim Wright thought he could get ships all the way to Fort Worth. And uh, so this, uh, so far as I know, this is a unique image of this uh, particular uh, bird's eye view map. And it was printed by the Dallas Lithographic Company. This is one of my favorite prints. I don't know anything about it. But it's the frontispiece to William Duncan's book, called Evolution and the True Light, which was published by the Texas Printing and Lithographic Company in Fort Worth in 1889. Uh, Mr. Dunn owned a hotel, and he has a picture of his hotel in the back of the book, but he has Sunday school lessons in the book. He has uh, lessons for farmers' families. 
He has suggestions on how to sleep well. He has suggestions on how to raise bees. You know, it's sort of the collected wisdom of Mr. Dunn's uh, age, I guess. But the frontispiece is this wonderful picture of heaven and hell. Here's Adam and Eve. God is casting them out of the garden. You can see the fire down here. That's hell. And you can see how beautiful heaven is. And there's no explanation. There's no connection to the, what's in the book. It's just there. So the interpretation, I'm sure, is up to you. But Mr. Dunn was pretty unorthodox. So keep that in mind. Uh, wonderful map of the city of Houston in 1868. This was printed in Philadelphia in four sheets. That's one sheet, that, a big, a big, beautiful, illustrated map of the city of Houston. And then we begin to get into other maps. This is by Mittendorfer, who worked at the land office. And it's published by Rossler, who did a whole series of maps in the mid-1870s. And he did them by stone engraving or something like that. It's slightly different from a lithograph. I haven't quite figured out exactly what the process is. Here's one of the county maps. He put a little uh, vignette on all of them, and on two of them, here we have a vignette of the Nash Iron Works in Marion County in 1857, and here we have a, a view of San Saba from the county college looking north. This is a little vignette on the county map of San Saba. 1876, a railroad, uh, uh, the, the Galveston merchants are building a railroad to San Antonio because San Antonio is the largest city in the country that's no longer not served by a railroad in 1876. So here's the map, and you can see it goes almost to Houston before it turns off. They don't want to get Houston involved in this railroad to San Antonio. They're building a railroad around San Antonio, if you, or Houston, if you will. And later, when the Galveston merchants also build the Santa Fe Railroad northward into central Texas, they also build it around Houston. So there's serious competition between Galveston and Houston at this point. This is one of my favorite books of all of them. It's by Governor Roberts, and he was in office when he published it. Uh, and basically, it's, it's uh, all the lectures that he was giving to his law school on, on Texas. And uh, the lithographer, I guess, added illustrations. You probably can't see it, but the little pig's tails are all curled in just the most precise way. These guys. You know, they're supposed to be working cattle, but looks like they're in a charro match. I mean, these illustrations, uh, you know, look at the mountains. This, this is not Texas. The, uh, the uh, St. Louis Globe Democrat referred to half a dozen ludicrous lithographs in the governor's book. But I want you to notice this map. Nice map of Texas. Where's Galveston? They were, they, were, they were so upset about the lithographs that they just, you know, they never noticed that Galveston was on the mainland. There's no island out here. So uh, Governor Roberts had a lot to answer for. And believe me, this, this book and these pictures became an extended discussion in the Texas newspapers, a riotous discussion, if you will, because they were really, they were, the opposition was afraid Gov Roberts was using it as a campaign ploy because he wanted to run for governor again. So they really took after him. But he, he didn't intend to run again. Th this is, uh, Fort Worth people did a takeoff on the Mikado called The Capitalist. They paraphrased it. Uh, you know, they, they were bat battling against the city of Dallas. But they did this map of uh, the railroads into Fort Worth. They were predicting that railroad, Fort Worth would become a rail center. And in fact, it, uh, it did. And on the back of the book, they looked at this uh, 1872 picture by uh, John Gass called American Progress of uh, Columbia leading people west. Here are the Indians who are uh, fighting from covered wagons going west, railroads going west, settlers going west. So they took that and called it from the blizzard region to Texas. So the lady is welcoming people from the cold weather down to the warm climate of Texas. And that's the back cover of that uh, Mikado uh, pamphlet. Austin, and what I really like about this print is, of course, the picture of the uh, dam. This, of course, is the one that broke and flooded much of the city. A nice map, though, and, and beautiful map here of Velasco. Velasco is advertising itself as the only deep water port in Texas. Uh, bird's eye views are continued into the 1890s, and Mr. Fowler uh, adds 
all these individual buildings to his bird's eye views, which are really incredible. And he's probably working from photographs because the buildings are really quite uh, accurate. And Houston Heights in 1900. Well, the lithographs tell quite a story of Texas. But here's what happened in 1900, the Galveston flood. And that changed the course of history in Texas as we all know. It also brought technology change because by 1900, printing was changing. In 1873, the New York Daily Graphic started printing a newspaper entirely from lithography. Pictures, text, everything printed entirely from lithography. That was unheard of in 1873, but they did it and they made it a success for a couple of, uh, of uh, decades. Then what happened? Well, halftone uh, images. Halftone images can actually reproduce a photograph by use of these screens, photograph through these screens, and you get a, and it's an actual photograph. So reproducing an actual photograph, rather than having a lithograph copy, an artist's copy, from the stone was a real revelation. And it is the secret of halftone printing is revealed. It made a major change in printing technology. And the artist Joseph Pennell said, lithography is now relegated to the cigar box maker, the printer of theatrical posters, or the publisher of chromos and comic prints. Well, to make a story short, lithography did make a comeback in the 20th century uh, we developed a way of printing off of uh, steel, steel plates in a roller, and that is lithography, and it was very successful, and it endured until the current uh, dot matrix printing. Now, I know this question has plagued you probably since you were a child. How do they get the M's on M&M's? Anybody? It's lithography. It's lithography, and that this is how it works. Well, the lithographs of Texas played a role in populating the state and in nurturing its culture. These diverse and little known pictorial remnants deserve attention today as one of the most neglected filters through which a 19th century audience, especially would-be immigrants, clarified their impressions of Texas and were often inspired to action. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions for Dr. Tyler? I'm, I'm standing between them and the bar, I know. <laughs> on, on, the early lithog on the early lithographs, uh, you, you mentioned that they were hand colored. Yes. And didn't that take an awful lot of time to do that? You oh had my to goodness, yes. When Audubon, after he did the Big Birds of America, Audubon did a little book on the Birds of America. Seven volumes, 500 illustrations, 70 colorists working full time from 1839 to 1844. You let it 70 full time colorists. It took a lot of time. Uh, and it was expensive, relatively speaking. But, but uh, before chromolithography, and chromolithography really didn't start in America until the 1840s and really didn't become very popular until after the Civil War. So hand coloring for most of the century was the way you got color. And usually you can tell the difference. Uh, you can look at a chromo and see that you know, there's overlapping, uh, the colors are out of register. There are a number of problems with chromolithography that, that don't exist in hand coloring. But by the 1880s, some of the printers were really getting good and it would be hard to tell the difference. Uh, so the, for a, a color lithograph, would you have to have a stone for each color? Is that, and then you had yes. to print it over yes. and over? Yes. Uh, by the 1880s and 90s, Lewis Prang in Boston was issuing fine chromo lithographs. He was copying paintings by Winslow Homer and Thomas Moran, two great American artists. Some of those stones would have more than, I mean, some of those prints would require more than 30 stones. Each one printing a slightly different part of the image and a slightly different color. 
It was not limited to the four basic colors. You know, we've, we finally refined the process down to four or six colors today. But that wasn't the way they did it. They would sometimes more than 30 stones. Right. And it was a process of registration, getting each stone to print in the right place. Okay. And that's why with early chromolithographs, it's so easy to tell that they're a chromolithograph because you can see that they're out of register. Uh, but that was, a, that was a problem that they did manage to conquer. But, you know, when they did that in the 80s and 90s, and, and half-tone reproduction is just around the corner, so that was the heyday of chromolithography. Didn't come back until we started doing real lithography by the method that we all know from, from 1900 until, gosh, 20 years ago. It was lithography. We have one more question over here. Could you tell us about this lithograph? That you found oh, this on the is screen? the funniest piece to uh, the little book on uh, the uh, Galveston, Harrisburg, and San Antonio Railroad. And uh, it was printed in St. Louis. And they're just using various elements that they consider to be characteristic of Texas. Was um, was that Sydney Sherman's Railroad is the question? Sherman's? No, I don't think so. It was, uh, I can't think of his name, but he was, a, he was a Philadelphia and Galveston businessman who uh, owned it and then, of course, later sold it. All right. Thank you, Dr. Tyler. Thank you.